In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, Dean. Just a moment. There are many altar servers, so it's kind of hard to deal with everything. Christ said to his disciples, greater things than these shall ye see. And that's true. And today I'm referring in my, uh, my homily to a miracle. And if we paid attention, if we listened very closely to the epistle reading today, we heard about this miracle. And St. James writes a little bit about St. Elias in his epistle. And it's only like a sentence or two. And the great miracle is hidden in those, what, 20 words. Now, if we're familiar with St. Elias, um, we know that he was from the Old Testament, and he was a prophet. One of 20-some prophets that we have. And if we came to church last night for Vespers, or we were here for Orthros, we heard that Elias was a man of great faith, um, he wasn't very rich, and he had some run-ins with some kings, and long story short, he prayed to God to teach these people, these wicked people in this land, a, a lesson, and what he did is he prayed ardently to God, and what happened? If we listen to the epistle, what happened? Does anybody know? Nicodemus knows. What happened? This is your favorite story. It didn't rain. For how long? Three years and six months. Could you imagine? I guess if you lived in California, you could. But here, no. And I was thinking as I was writing this sermon, I was like, well, Father Elias quotes the saint's name. Why don't you pray to stop some of the rain that we've been having, all the floods and, and everything. But the miracle wasn't that it rained, or that it didn't rain, or it did rain, or that, that you know, it, it was, didn't rain for six years, or three years and six months. But the miracle is that Elias was a man of like passions, just like you and I. He was a sinner, just like you and I. He breathed our air. He went through the daily cycle that we go through. But he prayed really, really hard. And he loved God. And because God knew that he loved him with his whole soul and with his whole mind, he granted that prayer to teach those people a lesson. That is the miracle. Not the drought, but the faith of a poor man like us. The great miracle that works, that God works within us, is when he changes a heart. And if you start to see your heart change, if you start to see yourself turn towards God, even if it's happening very slowly, which usually it does, that's the miracle. And as the saints tell us, some of the fathers of the church tell us, that that, our changing of heart towards God, is more of a, of a miracle than raising the dead. Because, as we know, we read in Scripture that God raises the dead all the time. It's nothing new. But for somebody to change their heart towards God, that's what causes, that's what causes the resurrection. We have to allow that grace to move through us so that we can be changed. So, today, we witnessed another miracle. We have in our midst, as the, as the service tells us, a newly chosen warrior of Christ, and he's sitting right here. Uh, I told him I was going to pick on him today. The newly illumined George. And I'm going to speak to you directly, but if this is a reminder for us all who have already been baptized, who have already been chrismated, and even though the water's dried and the chrism has seeped into our, our skin, the Holy Spirit behind that chrism still encompasses our heart and our soul. And St. Simeon, the new theologian, says, Baptism and chrismation does not take away our free will or our freedom of choice, but it gives us the freedom to no longer be tyrannized by the devil. 
unless we choose to be. And after chrismation, it is in the power of us either to, pers to persist willingly in the practice of the commandments of Christ, into whom we are baptized, and to advance in the path of his ordinances. Or we can choose to deviate from that straight path and fall into the hands of our enemy, the devil. And I always thought those were very powerful words, so remember those. I'll test you in a couple months. <clears throat> and I was thinking about these, while I was thinking about these words as I was writing this homily, we see this every day. When you walk into church and you see Father Elias or myself or some of the readers and some deacons or any clergy, any bishop, we're always wearing black. And everyone wonders, you know, why do you always have to wear black? It's such a terrible color. Well, the cassock is the flag of the church, as some of the monastics, monastic fathers of the church have said. And we wear black because, unlike us who wear white on our baptism, if we remember, what happens to white clothes if we wear them every day? They get dirty. And when they get dirty from our sins and our transgressions and our judgments towards people or non-forgiveness towards people, it turns black. And so the reason that clergy wear black is a reminder of our sins. And that our goal is to, by, not by ourselves, but with your help, to turn this black cassock into white again before we die. 